All right, welcome to video 17. I'm doing another video on analyzing scientific events using ideas from Ron Geary and the semantic view of theories because I realized that in order to answer uh, some exercise, an exercise that I've got later on in week eight, as well as um, some problems that are going to be on, the, on test two, I needed to explain a couple other ideas. So I'm just going to launch into that. First, some review. Um, I am utilizing something called the semantic view of theories, which says that a theory is fundamentally a collection of models and hypotheses that relate those models to the world. Um, and this, this is a notion, an understanding of the scientific method that... Um, has become very important recently because so much of the science that is used for uh, public decision making is model based. Um, and so, like I said before, everyone agrees that the scientific method is some kind of hypothesis testing. And then after that, it becomes complicated. But this is a view of hypothesis testing that centers the idea of a model. And that's important um, for understanding uh, science and being a good consumer of scientific information in the modern era. Um, just to give you an example of this, this is a, a tweet from Senator John Cornyn, um, who's not being a good um, consumer of scientific information in the modern era. Um, so he says, after COVID-19 uh, crisis pa passes, could we have a good faith discussion about the uses and abuses of modeling to predict the future? Everything from public health, economic to climate predictions, it isn't the scientific method, folks. Well, yes, yes, Senator, it is. And that is why the models that are used for COVID-19 and climate change and election predictions are incredibly important. So some tweets in reply here. I'm a climate scientist, happy to chat about how modeling is fundamental to all science and how encapsulating all encapsulating aspects in the world in mathematical language is central to any claim at understanding uh, how pop philosophical understandings of the scientific method don't go far. So you need to understand the scientific method at, at a deeper level. Someone else says, I'd be more than willing to discuss the role of, mo of modeling in the scientific method f with anyone. It's actually pretty fundamental to the whole predict, test, predict, test cycle. That is to say, Everyone agrees that the scientific method is some form of hypothesis testing. And right now, um, models are incredibly important for understanding what that um, cycle of pre making predictions and testing them really is all about. I want to uh, conclude with one final um, note. This is a popular slogan uh, for understanding models. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and so this this was an article that came out to help uh, to back in April to help understand the COVID nineteen models. And again, I want to um, the basic idea of the scientific method that I'm presenting here uh, builds in this idea that um, science is about modeling, and all models are um, all not well, the way I put it is that all models simplify. All right, so let's go back and start looking at eviction again. Um, I have the uh, Gire gives us a four box model of how to understand um, the scientific method. Um, on the left hand side uh, is the real world, and on the right hand side is our model of the real world, right? And so you take a statement like this. Between 2009 and 2011, there's a typo in that PowerPoint slide, one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced a forced move. Um, we need to understand the difference between the real world and our model of the real world. 
Um, and because I think often what happens when people misunderstand science is they get so sucked up in their representation of the world that the real world can sneak around and kick them in the ass. So um, this is the deal. The real world here is, um, in this case, the city of Milwaukee and anyone who rents in it. The model is a theoretical model. It's a bunch of um, variables and um, values for those variables that um, make a prediction or what can be used to make a prediction. Um, and one of the important things here is that this new theoretical model uses a broader definition of eviction. So it's not just the sheriff coming by and stacking your belongings on the curb. It is any kind of forced move. Um, and so changing that aspect of the model makes a new prediction. Um, just to circle back for a second, um, this is all from Desmond and Schulenberger, which is what you're going to be reading two modules from now. Um, and you're going to want to analyze it using these terms. So uh, I need to, uh, this is, this is to help you with that exercise. The expanded definition of a forced move is an example of what we call in the philosophy of science, the theory ladenness of observation. Whenever you make an observation of the world, you, um, it doesn't just come to you as a prepackaged fact. Um, your, the things that come to you as facts depend on a background of a theory that allows you to interpret the world. So uh, in the previous video, I used the example from Geary's book about Rosalind Franklin and the discovery of the structure of DNA. Rosalind Franklin had data. She had facts that um, the model had to predict. But um, you couldn't understand Franklin's data. Um, and they just look like blurry pictures of X's unless you know the theory behind the machine that made them, right? So something similar is going on here with our observations of what counts as a forced, uh, 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 what counts as an eviction. Um, we change our theory of what counts as an eviction, and then we get di uh, we we get a different number on the ground for the number of uh, how common eviction is. So. Um, to, in un, in module eight, I'm going to be asking you to analyze uh, two claims from Desmond and Schulenberger, and one of them is the one that we've already been talking about. Between 2009 and 2011, one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced a forced move. So to understand this, I want you to list some elements that are part of Gire's model of a scientific event, including what is the real world and what is our representation of the real world. So if you go back to this four box diagram, the real world um, is on the left. The model of the real world, which is a theoretical mathematical model, is on the right. In this case, um, the real world is going to be renters in Milwaukee. Uh, and sort of by further evident inference, renters nationwide. That's the real thing. Um, and I kind of want to emphasize that reality exists. Um, so on the other side is our representation of the real world. And this is a theoretical model that actually consists, in this case, of variables and values. And variables and values are terms that I want you to know for the test. Um, so variables are just properties that an individual in a population can have. And then the values are the different forms that that property can take. So it's standard in, you know, when you're doing statistics and probability to talk about marbles in an urn, right? And so you can say, uh, I've got a bunch of marbles in a big jug, and I'm going to pull some out at random, and I'm doing my, uh, I'm understanding statistics 
um, I'm using this to understand statistics where the odds that, for instance, the marble I pull out of this jug is red or green. Um, so in this case, the, uh, you've got a variable which can be color, um, and then that variable takes one or, one or two values, uh, in this case, red or green. So when we are building our um, picture of the world, we under, need to understand what the variables and what the values are. This is, this is fairly straightforward for the uh, simple example that we are doing now. So let's take this statement, one in eight Milwaukee renters experienced a forced move. When I discussed this earlier, I described it as a quantified categorical statement. That is, it's got a quantifier in it, one in eight. That is a, a thing that um, expresses a quantity. Uh, and then it's got two predicates, two categories, um, Milwaukee renters and people who experienced a forced move, right? So in this case, our variable, our, our first variable is going to be whether or not you are a Milwaukee renter. And the values for that are just yes or no. Um, and then... Um, the second variable is people who experienced a forced move. And again, the values there are yes and no. So when you're doing the exercise, that's how you want to fill it out, right? Um, you've got a real world, which is all uh, the people of Milwaukee. And then you've got a model of the real world. The model of the real world consists of two variables. And each of those variables takes two values, yes or no. All right, so science is about hypothesis testing. And what that means is that when you have the real world, you have to um, do something, interact with it in some way to see if your hypothesis holds up. Um, and so in this case, what you've got is uh, your interaction with the real world um, is something called MARS, the Milwaukee Area Renters Survey. And this is a survey of 1,086 people, right? So this is uh, data that has been extracted from the real world. Um, uh, you have isolated some small part of the real world to study. And in this case, um, that study is of 1,000 people. Um, and then the prediction that the, that the survey made was simply that um, if you use the larger definition of a forced move, more people will be, uh, uh, be seen to have made forced moves. That is, um, if you don't just count every time the sheriff comes and piles your possessions on the curb, but also all those times that the landlord uses other techniques to force you out. Um, such as, uh, well, cutting off the heat um, or removing the door to your apartment, which is one that Desmond mentions. Uh, these are also, these also now count as forced moves. And what we see is we get a larger number of people ma ha having made forced moves. So we've got... Um, our real world, and then we need a sample of the real world. So the other things that I'm asking you to fill in here are the sample, the sampling method, and a correlation or distribution diagram. I'm not going to give you these answers, but I want to just explain what I'm talking about here. So a population is the set of individuals that we're trying to make an inference about or that we want to understand. So in this case, our population is people who rent in Milwaukee. Our sample is a smaller portion of the population that actually gets studied. So the sample then is uh, the 1,086 people who were actually interviewed. One important thing that happens when you are a good consumer of scientific information uh, is that you need to keep track of how samples are created. The number one way that we um, 
statistics can wi that are presented to the public can wind up being misleading is through bad sampling methods. So I want to run through some vocabulary on different kinds of sampling methods. And then for the exercise, you need to go through and identify, figure out what sampling method Desmond and Schullenberger used. Okay. So, um, the gold standard in science is always a random sample. And a random sample is defined as a sample in which each member of the population has an equal chance of being in the sample. If you can pull that off, you have a genuinely random sample, um, and you, uh, that is the, you can have the most possible confidence that the sample that you have um, actually represents the whole population. A lot of times people don't use genuine random sampling. Um, and so two common substitutes are a self-selected sample and a sample of convenience. Self-selected samples are samples where people choose to be in the sample. So rather, for instance, than selecting people randomly um, by uh, calling phone numbers at random, you put up a notice on the internet and say, come take our survey. And then people choose to be in that survey. Um, anytime you've got a phone in poll on uh, the, uh, like Fox News does phone in polls all the time. They say, phone in if you think that Trump is awesome. Um, that is a self-selected sample because people choose to be in the sample. Another example would be a lot of sex surveys. People really hate it when you just call them out of the blue and ask them questions about sex. So most of our information about people's sex, sexual behavior in America comes from self-selected samples. There's a general rule with self-selected samples, which is, which is that they over-represent extreme cases. So with political surveys, um, a self-selected sample over-represents partisans, people with strong political opinions, and under-represents people who aren't really following politics. In sex surveys, actually, um, uh, self-selected samples over-represent over people who are um, kinky. Um, and so that's something to, take, to, to bear in mind whenever you um, hear uh, information about people's sexual behavior. If it was based on a self-selected sample, it's probably over-representing un unusual sexual behavior. Another common kind of sample is what we call a sample of convenience. So these are just individuals that happen to be accessible to the researcher. And this is extremely common in psychological surveys most psychological surveys wind up being conducted on undergraduates taking Psych 101 because it's a convenient sample for the psychiatrist to, or the psychologist to, to survey. You can just, you know, survey all the students in your intro class and you've got a, 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 an easy population to get to. Um, of course, undergraduates are... Uh, in college undergraduates are not representative of the population as a whole in all sorts of ways. They're younger. Um, uh, actually, only two-thirds of Americans ever take any college, and one-third of Americans ever actually graduates. So there's all sorts of ways in which a sample of convenience misrepresents people because it is a sample that is... Um, it is a sample that uh, is of the kind of people that are nearby researchers. The last kind of sample that I want to emphasize, uh, mention, is a stratified sample. Sometimes if you can't get a random sample, a genuinely random sample, what you do is you divide your population into subgroups, and then 
um, sample from those subgroups. So if you want to be sure, for instance, that African Americans are represented in your sample, you may actually divide your overall population into by, by ethnicity, by race, um, and then say, I'm going to sample randomly from the subset uh, that are African Americans. Um, and so this is a way of simulating a genuinely random sample when uh, a genuinely random sample is not possible. So of all the methods that I've given you here that are not genuinely random, this is the closest, uh, this is the best bet to genuinely random, the closest approximation of genuinely random. All right, so I talked about correlation and um, distribution correlation and causal models in the previous um, video. I don't want to go into intense detail about that, but just again, I'll note that this one in eight number, this is a pure distribution because you are only looking at um, one quantified categorical statement, one statement of the form, you know, um, this percentage of people have this property. Correlation models require you to relate to such statements. Um, so correlation models represent the distribution of two traits in a population. Uh, so for instance, if you say that African American women are overrepresented in eviction court, that's a correlation model. Um, you're going to have the overall percentage of people in Milwaukee who are African American women. Um, that's one distribution. And then the percentage of people in Milwaukee eviction court who are African American women, that's another distribution. You compare two distributions and you get a correlation. Last bit I want you to know about is margins of error. Oh, so for correlations, you, you draw a diagram that looks like this, right? Um, and I talked about that in the previous video. It's either going to have one box or two, um, or rather it's going to have one column or two, depending upon whether you're dealing with a correlation or a distribution. I want to make one final note about margins of error. Um, and actually, I don't like uh, the, I, this has a technical definition of margin of error, again, from Gire, but I don't, uh, you don't need to know this level of background. Basically, the margin of error is the chance, the, the range in which your sample is likely to deviate from the population as a whole. And one important thing to note is that the larger your population, I'm sorry, the larger your sample, the more likely it is to represent the population. So here are two things uh, here are two charts that I do want you to know to understand a rule of thumb margin of error. If you are dealing with a population of more than 50,000 individuals, this, is, this chart gives you just a rough rule of thumb for the margin of error. And this is any number over 50,000. Um, so uh, if you're trying to do something with the population of Milwaukee, where you're trying to do something with the population of the United States, where you're trying to do something with the population of the world, this distribute the, this chart applies. Um, so the good thing to know is that if you have a sample of 1,000 individuals, you get a plus or minus 3% margin of error. Um, and this is what most political surveys shoot for. So if, you, if, you're, if you're worried about the election and you're following election polling, you will see that um, all the election polling you're looking at uh, will probably have a plus or minus 3% margin of error. That is the difference between, uh, that is the range in which you can expect the actual population to vary from your sample. And margins of error are determined with a 95% confidence interval. So um, you can be, if you have a sample of uh, 1,000 individuals, and it turns out that, let's say, 60% um, of them are voting for Biden, that sample is, if that sample is random, 
That means that everyone in the United States has an equal chance of being in that sample. And then we know that 60% um, plus or minus 3% are, uh, are voting for Biden. So that could be as low as 57 or as high as 63. I just made this example up, right? Um, but uh, also you can be 95% sure that the overall result will be within 3% of that uh, 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 of the given number from the sample. This is just a quirk of math that I think is fascinating. Um, after a while, you reach a point of diminishing returns with increasing your sample size. So 1,000 people will give you a, a, a margin of error of plus or minus 3% for a population of 50,000 or 100,000, 250,000, um, it, it just goes up slightly. So for any value over um, like 100 million, uh, you still only need uh, 1,067 individuals to get your plus or minus 3% margin of error. The difficulty is having a genuinely random sample when you're dealing with 100 million individuals. All right, final note. Margin of error only covers mistakes that come from genuinely random samples. It does not cover mistakes cover that come from non-random samples or other problems in data ga gathering. So although the margin of error is you know, included in every survey you ever see publicized on a good news site, um, that is not the only source of error. In fact, it's um, not even the most common source of error. It is the source of error that we are able to quantify and deal with the best. But it is, um, and that's why we can, you know, we can give, the, give it this number, plus or minus 3%. But that's just errors that come from the process of random sampling itself and not errors that come from, um, that might come up because your sample wasn't really random to begin with or Maybe your question was worded badly or that sort of thing. Okay, so this should fill in the rest of the information you need on scientific method to do the um, uh, analysis of the scientific results we get from Desmond and Schulenberger and to answer questions in the test. If you have any further questions, please email me.